This place is literally awe-inspiring. This vessel here is a replica of the burial ship which is just up over the hill there uh, in which a Viking chieftain was buried a thousand years ago. The burial ship, what's left of it, which is really an imprint in the soil, is still there and you can see the remains of some of his animals that were buried with him and he was removed by grave robbers very shortly after the burial so Lord knows what dire deeds were done in those days but we are actually on the site of Danish Vikings here this is where it all happened and this vessel is the most wonderful replica of a, of a warship a longship that I've ever seen I'm going to Roskilde tomorrow so I don't know what that's going to be like but to be here at Ladbu in in the island of Finn is absolutely well it's remarkable the the, the, the reeds are up to the water's edge and the ship itself is 70 odd feet long and you just look at it this vessel is going to absolutely fly given the right conditions and I'm going to have a look at it a model in, in a little while there's a model of it in the little museum up here and I'm going to have a look at that and point out one or two details about the rig and about how it worked but looking at this fantastic replica uh, it just seems to float on the water as if it's weightless. It just is, is it's the most thrilling thing to look at. Um, we think our boats are beautiful, but really, when you look at this and you see the sheer harmony of it, it's difficult to get your head around it. And looking at some of the details, it's just full of details. The guys have done such a wonderful job here. The, the forestay, very simple adjustment. We've got a a tarred hemp lanyard that comes round the stem of the vessel right through the planking there through all the strength of the vessel uh, coming onto the forestay itself which is also tarred hemp coming down from the masthead and it's so simply adjusted it's got this wooden lever you adjust the length of it using that sheet bend there and then you crank it round with the lever and just seize the lever to the, to the, to the stay itself and that's it it couldn't be simpler. I've seen these things in West Norway years and years ago, but I haven't seen one for ages, and I'm, I'm thrilled to see that. And uh, moving down the vessel, looking at the rowing positions here, we can see that essentially the oar was literally offered up through a round hole in the top strake, and the oar holes, I don't know what they're called, are, are closed off by leather and a very simple wedging device which is driven in from the inside and that would render them reasonably waterproof. These vessels always made a certain amount of water at sea one way and another. I'm sure quite a lot slopped over and they were bailing them all the time so uh, a little bit of extra through there wouldn't really have mattered. The mast step is, is fascinating. It steps over, over four thwarts which are themselves on sort of ring frames to the floors underneath, underneath, the, uh, the, underneath the sole that you'd walk around on uh, into the structure of the ship. And the aft end of the mast step is, is, is open so that the mast can be lowered at sea onto that great big yoke in the stern. And if you go to the stern you can see there's a, a little strap there and I guess outside there will be a socket to take the steering oar which of course is on the steerboard side on the starboard side of the vessel which is the only place for it to be there's some very interesting things here and I don't know what they are uh, in the side of the ship they're round about where the forward end of the uh, the yard will be when it's braced round sharp for the boat to go to windward and I think they may be uh, sockets for accepting the beta pole which sent the luff of the sail outboard a little way and helped to sharpen it to give it a good aerofoil. Well, we could go on about this all day, couldn't we? But the main thing is, I just wanted to share with you the sheer spiritual nature of seeing this vessel floating in her home waters with all the winds of history blowing over her. Makes you realise who you are and where you've come from. Who'll come after us? But these guys came before us, and they knew a lot.
We're inside the museum now where there is a model of the replica longship that we've been looking at outside, which is uh, in itself a replica of the ship in which the chieftain was found buried. There's all sorts of things here we could talk about, but I'm just particularly interested in the sail. And I thought uh, any sailors amongst the listeners might be interested to see one or two features here. I've learned something about these sails from sailing the Femburing in Norway, which is a, a direct descendant of these vessels. And uh, what you're looking at is a square sail, which on the face of it would drive the boat downwind or on a board reach. It might just manage a beam reach with the wind coming straight across the boat at a pinch. Not much of a keel down there, but if the boat's moving fast enough, she would gain considerable lateral resistance by the virtue of her sheer speed through the water. Now then, if you're going to go to windward with a boat, sail with the wind forward of the beam and make some ground upwind, you need to have the front of the sail, the luff, that's this edge here, has got to be as straight as you can get it. And that's always been the problem with square sails. And the Vikings were very advanced with this. Um, a couple of features here. For a start, there are two little ropes you can see halfway up the luff here. Those are what we now call bowlins. And those are led to the forestay through a turning block and back down into the ship where the boys could pull them. By pulling that, it hauls the luff out tight and helps keep it straight. At the bottom of the luff, is what's called the tack of the sail. The tack is the windward bottom corner of the sail and it's bows down and on this model interestingly it's bows down to a piece of wood which is really a spar which is going across the boat. Now if they wanted to get a bit extra they could push that spar out a little way and, and force the luff out to get more stretch and to get it tighter. And that spar was called, I don't know how it's pronounced, but it was called a beta. And the bottom of the sail is the tack. So you see, when the boat's going to windward, she's beating because she's using the beta. And we still use that term. And when she comes through the wind to sail the other way to make ground to windward, she switches tacks. And this one, which is the starboard tack, is taken off and led aft, and the port tack goes forward. And that's why it's called the port and the starboard tack, when the boat's tacking. There are some interesting little features in the middle of the sail here, and I've not seen these on a full-sized uh, Viking square sail before, but I've certainly seen them on Northland's boats in Norway. Um, you see, just behind the mast, there are ropes led to a strong point in the middle of the sail. If they were suddenly caught by a squall with the sail braced up sharp like this, it could blow the boat over quite easily because there's not a great deal of stability in these boats. They are fast, my word, they're fast, but they're not very stable. They could dump the wind very quickly by pulling one of those ropes and letting fly the ropes at the bottom, the tack and the clue lines. That would turn the sail inside out and dump wind from it in no time flat. And that was an important feature, but I've never seen it before on a vessel of this size. One last point I'd like to make is about steering the vessel. Everybody knows that these boats were steered with a steering oar because you really couldn't have a rudder on a stern as beautiful and shapely as that. So a steering oar was rigged that came out one side and you can see it very clearly here. It was always on the right hand side of the boat looking forward. And that is called the steerboard side, because the steering oar in, in, in Norse languages is called the steerboard. So there it is on the starboard side of the boat, always the starboard side, and we still have it today. And of course, if you're going to put the boat alongside a dock, you don't want to damage your steerboard, so you put the other side on, and that's the port side. So there you go, port and starboard, courtesy of the Vikings.